some of you may remember that a while ago I made a video about how much sunlight each part of the Earth would receive if the Earth were flat and the Sun were hovering in a circle above us like many flat earthers would say it is. Aside from the obvious conclusion that nighttime is not possible, there were some significant climate impacts as well. The Arctic Circle would be too hot to support ice at any time of the year, and places like Australia and South Africa would be pretty cold compared to the rest of the world. But a few days ago, someone came across the video and asked an interesting question. When we check the mass of energy coming from the sun, how long will it take until it runs out of power if it were small and local? I think we would need a new sun every day. And how can we start nuclear fusion if the sun is small, as they would tell us? All becomes worse without gravity. Maybe they can show us how nuclear fusion works with density and buoyancy. I just had to investigate and I will focus on the first part of that question. Now my initial instinct was to agree with the statement, so I took a pen to some paper and went to figure this stuff out. As you can probably hear on the audio, it is a pretty stormy day today, so I thought I'd spend some time exploring this. As is normal when doing flat earth related stuff, you have to ignore a lot of things to make sure that stuff doesn't fall apart at the first hurdle, and I will simply perform the calculations based on measurements that we can take today. I will take the current solar luminosity constant, and assuming that this doesn't change over time, calculate how long the flat Earth sun will last. We start with repeating these simple measurements from Eratosthenes, being careful to only take two measurements so we can retain our delusion of the Earth being flat. We'll measure during the equinox at the equator and 5,000 kilometers north of that. We then figure that the sun is 5,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. From our point at the equator, we measure the angular diameter of the sun at 0.5 degrees of arc, so the radius is 0.25 degrees. This then allows us to calculate the radius of the sun using simple trigonometry, and we figure that the actual radius is 43.6 kilometers. We can then calculate the volume of the sun using 4 over 3 pi r cubed, and we finally figure out the mass of the sun using the established value for the average density of the sun at 1408 kilograms per meter cubed. So now we have information about the size, location and mass of the sun, but we now must consider the power output. We take the solar irradiance constant, which is the amount of power the sun delivers per square meter at our distance from the sun. Now this is measured at 1361 watts per square meter. By taking an imaginary sphere with a radius equal to a distance to the sun, we can multiply the surface area of that sphere by this constant to get the total power output of the sun. And this is for 127 petajoules every second. So we can now take the mass energy equivalence and rearrange it for mass to calculate how much mass this energy corresponds to, and we'll use the symbol capital Phi for the amount of mass lost per second, and this adds up to 4.75 kilograms per second. So we can now divide the mass of the sun by this to get a figure for how long the sun can burn off fuel at this rate, which is roughly 407 million years. This surprised me, I expected it to be quite a bit less than that, but now I'm thinking about something else. Intuitively, it seems rather silly to think that the mass loss rate is constant. It would be far more sensible to say that the fractional mass loss rate is constant, so currently, 4.75 kilograms is being converted every second. As a fraction of the sun's total mass, this is roughly 9.7 times 10 to the minus 18. We could use the formula for compound interest to figure out the mass of the sun over time, where R is the interest rate or our fractional mass loss rate. N is the number of times that interest is applied in a period, and T is the number of periods. M0 is the initial mass, or the ma mass we measure today, and M is the final mass. Now, we will take T in seconds, and we let N approach infinity to get the expression for continuous interest. And we note that R is a negative number. Now we see something important straight away. This is an exponentially decaying function, so the sun will never disappear, but it will become infinitely small. With a fractional mass loss rate of 9.7 times 10 to the minus 18, we calculate that the sun would halve in size every 2.2 billion years. 
So we can calculate the mass of the sun as a function of time, and we can then calculate the mass loss rate as a function of time, and by extension, when we calculate the solar irradiance, we get this figure. Now, I'm not accounting for atmospheric effects and only considering direct irradiance, not any effects due to the firmament. But let's go to the real world for a bit and figure out how much the sun contributes to our current temperature. We know that the solar irradiance at our place in the solar system is 1361 watt per square meter. So the total power absorbed by the Earth can be calculated by the projection of the Earth's surface onto the path of the light and multiplying this by the irradiance. Only one half of the Earth is exposed to the Sun, so we can take the surface area as the surface area of a disk with the radius equal to that of the Earth. So we get that the power input for the Earth is pi times the radius of the Earth squared multiplied by this irradiance. In thermal equilibrium, the power input must match power output, and we'll treat the Earth as a black body which radiates according to the Stefan Boltzmann law where J is the irradiance, or the power per unit area put out. T is the temperature, and sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. But the Earth radiates in all directions, so the power output is this multiplied by the total surface area of the Earth. But we can now equate the power input and the power output, and start cancelling terms, and we can rearrange for temperature. So we see that the fourth power of the temperature of the Earth is proportional to the solar irradiance, and when we plug in the values, we get 2.78 Kelvin. But the Earth has an albedo of 0.3, which means that around 30% of the incident radiation just gets reflected without absorption. So we can introduce that into our term. And we calculate 255 Kelvin or minus 18 Celsius, which is the Earth's black body temperature. The actual average temperature is uh, 288 Kelvin or 15 Celsius. And this extra temperature comes from greenhouse effects and other processes. But let's go back to our flat Earth scenario and this graph. Because we can use these values to calculate the black body temperature throughout history. Now I am aware that the way we derive the black body temperature as a function of solar irradiance is based on the heliocentric model, so it may not be obvious how we can still use it. The reasoning is quite simple. The average irradiance over the surface of the Earth is the product of the Sun's power output and some geometric factor f, regardless of the geometry of the system. And with the black body radiation law we can simply state this. Or we can write it in terms of the sun's power output and that geometric factor f. If we accept that this expression yields the correct result of 255 Kelvin, and if we set p as equal to zero, this expression is also equal to zero, and we accept that this geometric factor is independent of the sun's power output, then we conclude that all of this is a constant and its value is the same for the flat Earth or the heliocentric model. It doesn't matter. Now, this is one of those things that you shouldn't actually look into too closely if you want to convince yourself that the Earth is flat. But back to our graph where we calculated the black body temperature of Earth over time. But to put this on a more intuitive scale, we'll convert to Celsius and focus on the history. I have also added a line to bring in the greenhouse effect, but I'm just adding a constant value based on today's greenhouse effect, and I'm ignoring that it would have been far greater on the early Earth. It would be interesting to properly calculate it, but this is tricky, and the point comes across rather clearly if I just use this simple fudge. And we'll stick some key events for the development of life on Earth on this graph. Now, when we look at these temperatures, you don't really have to suspend disbelief for the Hadean period, as it was a pretty hot time. Even for the first single-celled life, it is not that incredible. After all, extremophiles do exist. However, when we get to photosynthesis, this all falls apart. Photosynthesis relies on enzymes which are pretty temperature sensitive, and the black body temperature of the Earth is already on the upper range at which photosynthesis can happen, and organisms would have been too simple to have complex temperature control mechanisms like the one we see today.
If we then introduce the greenhouse effect, it all gets pretty messed up. Now, I must reiterate, the orange line just shows the added 33 degrees due to the greenhouse effect that we observed today. This would have been far more back then, with more greenhouse gases and, in the flat Earth case, far greater solar irradiance. Now, without this photosynthesis, the atmosphere would not become oxygen-rich and eukaryotic cells would not really develop. Eukaryotes can exploit anaerobic respiration, but they don't really survive for a very long time as the waste products are very nasty. Well, some are more fun than others. Without eukaryotes, there would be nothing to develop into multicellular organisms and, by extension, no plants, fungi or animals would develop. So all in all, based on these calculations, it seems that it's pretty unlikely that complex life would be possible on a flat Earth. So how would we square that with a lot of flat Earth claims? The only one I can think of is that the Earth is actually only 6,000 years old and all of this is moot because magic. So that was it really. Uh, there are a lot of things that I didn't consider and as a result these calculations are based on pretty contrived situations. Now I am sure that people will point them out in the comment section and probably think of other things to explore but just remember that we are dealing with flat earth here. So with that I would like to thank my patrons who are Thomas Miller, Kate Ebnetter, Walter Bislin, Johnny Ragadu, Mike Harris, Paul Bates, Adalbert Red, and I hope that I pronounce this right, Radek Stajny, Paul Schnus, Stan Zaystef, Cy Blacklock Hughes, Stringer News One, Richmond Clemens, Duranku, Ugly German Tris, Kai Brooking, Michelle Randall, and Lucas Schmidt. You guys are awesome and you really help me maintain my channel. Now, if you have any thoughts, comments, or if you want to tell me how wrong I am, then I am always and leave a comment below. Thank you for watching and you will catch me soon.